Writing code is fun at all, but at some point, you're going to want to see your code affect something in real life. Well, the good news is that there are so many little sensors, lights, motors, and controllers out there that really anyone can get started making electronic gadgets that bring their code into the real world. But I found recently that getting started with making electronics requires a pretty specific set of tools and equipment. So I thought I'd make a video covering what you need so you don't end up like me taking several trips to either stores or orders from Amazon just to get started. So I'm going to break this down into three sets. One is tools, the second is components, and the third is some basic modules and dev boards you can use for relatively cheap to get your feet wet. All the stuff I mentioned in this video will be linked in the description below, and if you buy from the links, it costs you nothing more, but the seller cuts me a small percentage, which helps partially fund the expensive YouTube hobby I have here. First off, let's talk about components. This is pretty much all the little parts and pieces you need when working with or developing basic electronics. A breadboard. A breadboard is the heart of any electronics prototype. For the uninitiated, a breadboard is a device that allows you to easily power and connect components with jumper wires and pins. The channels down the sides are usually for hot and ground, while the rows in the center are connected to each other so you can connect components together. You absolutely need one of these to get started, and I would recommend buying a large one, even though I didn't. I regret this decision. Jumper wires. If you want to connect devices together on a breadboard or hardwire components with soldered wires, these little jumper wires will save a ton of time. You can buy whole sets for just a couple bucks, and believe me, you're going to need them. Plain wire. It doesn't hurt to have some plain stranded wire lying around. It always comes in handy, and if you're looking for something super flexible, make sure to get the silicon coated wire. You can even strip it by just pinching and pulling. Mounting screws. If you make something more permanent, you're probably going to want to mount it. I recommend buying a kit containing standoffs, screws, and washers to make this easier than a random trip to the hardware store every time. Socket kit. One lesson I learned really early on in my first project is that sometimes you don't want to permanently connect stuff with solder. If you want components or wires that can easily clip together, get yourself a JST connector kit. This little kit comes with connectors of various sizes and the wires with the internal clips pre-crimped and attached. It's a huge time saver. Resistors and capacitors. So many electronic projects require resistors and capacitors. Now you can buy them individually at different capacities, but most of the time you won't really know what you need until the moment you need it. That's why I recommend buying one of these sampler platters. It has common capacities all in one package so you can just grab what you need when you need it. LEDs. I think this is a pretty self-explanatory one. <laughs> what is a good electronics project without LEDs? You could buy a package of single LEDs for super cheap, and they even come with the required resistors in the box. Header ends. Different components and modules either come with header pins pre-attached or with just holes where you can add your own headers. Personally, I prefer when they don't come with the headers attached, so I can solder them in myself if they're necessary. Adding them is way easier than removing them. Either way, at some point, you're going to need some headers to attach pins to your boards. Grab a set and keep them handy. Header jumpers. While similar to breadboard solid core jumpers, these specific DuPont jumpers, as I learned they're called, uh, allow you to easily patch components in a variety of different ways. These jumpers come with male-to-male -male ends, male-to-female ends, and female-to-female -female ends. When you have all of them, it's easy to attach components and stuff together or stuff to a breadboard without plugging the components itself into the breadboard. USB cables. I know it seems simple, but get a variety of USB cables. Many microcontrollers are powered by USB voltage, so they always come in handy. One thing to look out for though, with micro USB cables, sometimes they are only power cables and don't work for data at all. I recommend getting one that has power and data and put a label on it. It's no, it's no fun trying to flash your microcontroller with a cable that doesn't support data. Ask me how I know that. Various power supplies. Different types of devices need different amounts of power. Now, I'm not going to claim to be anywhere close to even amateur when it comes to understanding how electricity works, but I know that eventually you'll need more than a USB cable. USB can provide 5 volts and a minimal amount of current. Other types of power supplies, however, can provide different voltages and more capacity for higher current draw. I'll link to a few different ones in the description. Heat shrink tubing. Let me tell you a secret. Electrical tape sucks and it's not permanent. If you want to splice two wires together permanently, get some heat shrink tubing. Just solder the two wires, 
slide the tube over the exposed metal, and then run a lighter over it for a few seconds. Batteries are a battery bank. Looking to make something that won't be permanently strapped to a wall, you're gonna need a battery. Again, if you're just doing USB powered stuff, you can get a plain old phone charger battery bank. As you advance through making stuff though, you might need something more specific, but that really depends on your project. All right, that's the end of the first chunk and I'll get to the tools in just a second. But before I get there, and I'll make this quick, I really need to know if you wanna see more stuff like this. I know it's a departure from my normal content, but honestly, just talking about code and concepts all the time gets kind of boring. So if you like this, let me and YouTube know by hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel, commenting, or what I'm starting to believe is the most important thing to YouTube, watching all the way to the end. Or if you know, if you're feeling extra generous, do all of them. Anyways, onto the tools. You can easily get started by just plugging wires into a breadboard, but eventually you're gonna need to do more than that. For me, it happened pretty quickly, like within a week. So here are the tools that I ended up needing. A soldering iron. I'll start with the obvious one. If you wanna attach things more permanently, you're gonna need a soldering iron. When I started, I had an old one laying around, but pretty quickly came to the conclusion that I needed a new one. You can spend anywhere from 20 bucks to hundreds on a soldering iron, but I ended up with this battery powered rechargeable one with a pretty fine tip and it gets the job done. Soldering starter kit. Once you have a soldering iron, the next obvious thing you need is soldering accessories. There are a ton of options out there, but I ended up buying a kit that came with the basics and again, it gets the job done. This is what came in the kit. Solder. You can get solder in various thicknesses and compositions. This is 0.8 millimeter diameter and it does contain lead. You can also get lead free solder if the lead freaks you out. But honestly, just wash your hands afterwards and don't huff the fumes. This cleaning thingy, I don't know what it's called, but it's a ball of metal and you jam the tip of the iron in there just to clean it off. Tip tinner. Just dunk the iron in here occasionally to clean it up and keep it shiny. Flux. Flux is like soldering magic goo. Put it on your contacts before applying solder and it helps it apply like butter. Solder removing wick. This little magical wick will allow you to remove solder from stuff. Just wedge it between the solder and the tip of the iron and it kind of sucks it up. Magnifying glass or a phone app. If you're old like me, you'll definitely need something to look at these tiny parts up close. Anyways, this kit has the basics and it costs less than buying all that stuff individually. Let's move on to more essential tools. Wire strippers. Get yourself some of these fancy wire strippers that have the squeezy spring-loaded thing at the top. It's so much better than the old school ones you see in everybody's toolbox. Helping hands. Basically, it's impossible to solder stuff without three hands, at least. The helping hands are just a set of clips and a magnifying glass that'll hold the stuff you want to wire up so you can use your real hands for soldering and for handling the iron. I'm pretty sure that the one I bought is the cheapest one on the planet, so do some research and look at reviews. There's a ton of options out there. Needle nose pliers. Sorry, pretty self-explanatory. Wire cutters. Clipping the little ends off the dangly electronic parts will clean up your work and reduce the chance of short circuit. Get some wire cutters that allow you to get in really close to your work. Hot glue gun. Just need to get that thing that you made jammed into some enclosure. Hot glue to the rescue. Seriously, if it's good enough for big electronics manufacturers, why not you? A solder sucker. I seriously didn't even know this was a thing until I had to remove solder from a component and just couldn't figure it out. This little gizmo uses pressure to suck hot solder out of places. Just heat up the solder, then place the sucker and pop, it's gone. Multimeter. Multimeters are another one of those tools with a huge range of price and capability. I ended up buying this one from a big box store and it was not the cheapest, but also not the most expensive. I mostly use it to test continuity between different parts of my project. Just touch the leads between two different metal bits and if electrons flow between them, it'll beep. Super helpful for finding shorts or bad solder jobs, which you'll certainly have if you're just getting started. USB current meter thingy. Okay, this might not be absolutely necessary, but I absolutely love this thing. If you're working on a project where energy usage matters, this little device will give you all the details you need. Screwdrivers. Finally, a set of small screwdrivers. I have these little ones with the exchangeable heads and they come in super handy. Okay, now for the final category. I'll make this one short since the video is pretty long already. So if you got all that stuff, what are you gonna do with it? Honestly, you kind of have to know what you want to make before you start buying components. But here's a few things that I recommend as a simple and cheap way to get started. ESP32. 
Just to defend myself from the comment correctors out there, the ESP32 is actually just the chip on this board. But when you buy an ESP32 dev board, you get a ton of capability in a small and cheap package. The ESP32 can be programmed using the same IDE and framework as Arduino branded microcontrollers, but for a much lower price. I highly recommend starting with one of these simple boards just to play around. Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi is less of a microcontroller and more of a small lightweight computer. It runs a flavor of Linux and can generally do more than an ESP32, but it's also more expensive and definitely not necessary if all you want to do is control some LEDs or something like that. LED strip. And speaking of LEDs, get yourself a simple WS2812B addressable LED strip. They come in different densities, but all of them are super easy to control and make a very simple first project when paired with an ESP32 dev board. Motion sensors. A simple motion sensor connected to a microcontroller can make some really cool smart home stuff come to life. I recommend grabbing a couple just to play around with. Cameras. While the ESP32 cam is not exactly a high quality camera, it is a fun toy and relatively cheap. This little board is an ESP32 chip with a camera attached. Keep in mind that it doesn't have a USB port, so you might want to have the companion USB serial board for flashing it. Otherwise, I found a video that explains how to use another ESP32 with USB as the USB to serial adapter for the ESP32 cam, if that makes any sense. <laughs> the link to that is up here. An LED matrix. Okay, yeah, more lights, but these are in a grid. There are a ton of things you can do with this, and it's a good practice for making a larger project. Okay, people, this video has gone long enough. If you want to see more stuff along these lines, let me know by liking the video or commenting. Thank you for stopping by, and until next time, happy coding.